State Government Finance and Veterans Affairs Committee will come to order. We have uh, four bills on the agenda today, and uh, it looks to me that they will be held over. But before we start with the bills, I would like to talk money, targets, ways and means committee met this morning and adopted the targets that was, were issued to the committee chairs last week. Five committees do not have any money in addition to what was presented in the omnibus bill, finance bill, in May. State government finance and veterans affairs is one of those committees. So our budget cannot be open for any agency of our 30 agencies that we are responsible for funding. We have no new money. <coughs> no matter what the hurt people heard on the radio or television or even in their local newspapers that they read about the big surplus. This committee has jurisdiction over no new money at this time or ever, except if we get another, if we get other bill or a pension bill. But that will be carried, the money will not be carried in this committee. The money will be car carried in ways and means. I would like to read the document that I received from the speaker last week. General fund target for state government is zero. <clears throat> Veterans Housing Select Committee recommendations will be carried in the other bill category. No fee increases or transfers from other funds permitted. Pension bill costs will be carried separately at $22 million above base for fiscal year 1415 with a tails target of $44 million. <coughs> Unquote. Represent Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, just to your point, uh, we, have, we have dealt with several veterans' bills in this committee and, and uh, signing them forward, and many of them require some extra funding. So are we just spinning our wheels for our veterans' bills? I know I have a bill up today, two, 2011, that's going to require some uh, funding uh, from the Department of Administration. Um, what are our plans to uh, support uh, these veterans' bills that we're, that we're working on? I mean, uh, we, uh, we need to go forward with, with some of these bills, and, and uh, some of these bills are, are priorities for the Commander's Task Force. Represent Detmer. The Department of Administration budget was approved by the omnibus bill in fis for fiscal year 1415 that was adopted by the legislature in May. The Department of Administration general fund target 
for state government is zero. <coughs> if the appropriation, which most, some agencies received a boost on last May and haven't spent all their money, if they can assume the costs, we can consider it. But before this week, we heard the veterans' bills and other people's bills that didn't have anything to do with veterans. We heard bills. We've heard bills in almost every single meeting that we've had. And those bills were sent on to the committees where the appropriation could be made. If we still have the bill today and they cost money and the department cannot accept responsibility for paying for it, we will still have that bill in our jurisdiction at the end of this session. Thank you. Representative Lane, House File 2166. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that House File 2166 be considered by the committee. And I guess that's what we'll do. We'll consider it. <laughs> Um, you're making it very clear that the budget year is last year, the bonding year is this year, and a discussion practically, right? <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, but we need to go forth and at least air this and, and talk about it, and maybe there's some way that at least the policy part can get in. So um, this is the electronic roster study uh, bill that... Uh, um, I would like to right now, in fact, take out some of the money if I could move an amendment for that. Representative Lane. <clears throat> An oral amendment. So it's uh, one part is deleted and then there's two references to that part. So page three, delete lines 25 through 30. That's one reference to it. And page four, line 12, delete everything after the period. And then page four, delete lines 13 through 14. Oh, let's go. Now, page three, you have delete lines 25 through 30. I move that on page three. We delete, we delete lines 3.25 through 3.30. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Rep the next one, Representative. Page Lane. four, line 12, delete everything after the period. <laughs> period of counties? Everything after the word counties? Yes. Just in that second. In 412. I move that we adopt after the word to delete all words after after counties on page 412. So that would include 4.13 and 4.14. And for delete 13 and 14. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is adopted. And the last one, page 4, delete lines 13 through 14. Oh, okay, that's the same thing. We just did that. So we're done. Um, we want on page four, don't. That's where I said um, after 12, we'd also add 13 and 14. So we did that in the last amendment. Yes. And so on, what's your last amendment then? That's it. That's it right there. I, I, I combined two of them. Okay. So we want all of section two removed? 
No. No. Um. Well, Representative Lesh. Uh oh. Well, that was my oh. question, Madam Chair. I'm wondering what. Uh, what about the rest of Section 2, and, and how much does that reduce the cost overall? And says who, really? Yeah. We're deleting the build and buy. Mm -hmm. We're deleting the uh, build and buy analysis, which Minute would do. Um, so that takes out $100,000, $110,000, and uh, which section is this one right here? And that's what we deleted from. 4, 12, 13, and 14. Why aren't we deleting the whole yes. section 2, Ms. Lane? Representative Lane, Ms. Fraser. <laughs> the whole appropriation? Because <laughs> we're hoping that somewhere along the line we might be able to find $90,000 to help municipalities do this study that we've put a lot of work in during the interim. We're hoping that we can get a study out of this that tells us how much it actually will save us all to do this. Um, the Senate uh, is still moving forth on this bill. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that they will have that discussion and carry out the rest of it. Maybe they'll find some money somewhere. <laughs> Good. Why don't we um, delete all of Section 2 and stay true to the general fund target for state government? All right, if that's your request, yeah. I move that we delete on page four all of section two. Okay. Representative, Madam Chair, can we walk through those changes again? I didn't get all of them. Okay, let's do this one first. Okay, on page four, lines 4.5 through 4.14, delete all. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The motion is adopted. So we deleted section two on page four. We deleted subdivision eight on page three. The whole thing? Yes. Three point two five to three point three oh. In that light, Madam Chair, we would like to then um, change the part that talked about the evaluation and just make it a report from the Secretary of State that would not cost any additional money, but we have to give him the authority to uh, do this report. So on line 3.17, the Secretary of State must, and it had to do this uh, empirical study, so we just want to say the Secretary of State must provide a report. And uh, skipping everything else down to, okay, this... Uh, eliminating everything else down to 3.22 where it says by April 1st. So the Secretary of State must provide a report on the use of electronic rosters in the 2014 general, um, state general election and then skip down to by April 1st, 2015. Madam Chair. Representative Wills. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just concerned with us dissecting this bill with piecemealing the amendments and with our 24-hour rule. I'm concerned with potentially doing undue damage to the bill and, and not making sure that we have clear language. Um, it, it concerns me that we're doing this right now. I hoped to not. I didn't know I'd have to do this, so I didn't have anything prepared in that sense, but I, we'd had thought about this. Um, and we didn't expect it to go this far. Madam Chair, Wills. I would like to respectfully request that all of these changes are addressed in a proper amendment and abide by the 24-hour rule in a later, at a later time. Representative Wills, we've never issued a 24-hour rule. We've never requested a 24-hour rule. We've urged 24 hours, but we have never I've never held true to a 24 hour. In fact, Representative Detmer has built an amendment that I just received at five minutes to 12. Representative Wills. Madam Chair. Um, you want and, another motion? And I, I do respect that. Um, my concern is that we don't have any actual language in front of us and we're 
making these changes rather you on the have another topic. motion, Representative Wills. Right. I would make a motion that we have the changes drafted up at least into some form of, of amendment that we can look at and see the, the contrast of the language. Thank you. Do you have another motion? I'm still learning how to do this. How do I make a motion on this? Madam Chairman. Move that we would have a written amendment. Can I have a suggestion? Why don't we just have staff repeat the amendment? Slowly, and I think we'll all understand it. Mr. Shepard or Ms. Roberts? Yeah. Mr. Shepard, Ms. Roberts? Um, Is that okay, Representative? I just want to make sure we're not having any confusion in the language, especially when we're making such <laughs> significant changes. Thank you. Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not having any problem with the language. It's, it's um, uh, I'm having a problem with, with the intent in, in terms of there's still going to be a request for information from the counties. Um, it's, a, it's a new one on me that the Secretary of State will be able to do uh, any kind of study without any money. But, um, but for evaluation, the Secretary of State must requisition an empirical evaluation of the use of electronic <coughs> rosters in 2014. That remains or does that go? That's out. That goes. So all subdivision seven in terms of the evaluation goes? That, no. Madam Chair. Ms. Fraser. Th thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Beth Fraser, the Deputy Secretary of State. So basically what we're doing here is we have, there were three appropriations in the bill. And at first, Representative Lane recommended getting rid of one of them. And now the chair has suggested getting rid of all of them. And so there were the three pieces of funding. One was to go to a study, a builder buy analysis that was going to be conducted by minute to decide whether or not it made sense for the state to build its own electronic roster software technology or to use one of the many vendors, allow local governments to choose which of the many vendors that are already developing the technology. So that was deleted, the study, since it, since it seems that there are so many vendors that are already developing the technology and we should allow local governments to choose which of the vendors they want. So first we deleted that appropriation for $110,000 and the re requirement in subdivision eight that that analysis be conducted. The other two appropriations, one is $90,000 to reimburse local governments for costs that they will likely incur using electronic rosters in 2014. So it was about $5,000 per precinct that was going to use the rosters. That was a $90,000 appropriation that has been deleted. The other, the other appropriation is for an, an empirical evaluation that was estimated to cost $146,000. And so if we're removing the funding for our office to contract with somebody to do that professional evaluation, our office is willing to do a report. As we did this past year, we did a report based upon the task force and the pilot project the legislature authorized last year. We're happy to do a report which is what's in subdivision seven, but we would request that the details of what we were going to pay somebody to do be deleted from the requirement to do the report. So we will do as good a report as we can working with the counties, but we would request that the uh, bill say, the secretary must provide a report on the use of electronic rosters in the 2014 state general election by April 1st to the chairs and ranking my minority members of the committees. So we're looking to delete all the details that we would have paid somebody $146,000 to do. Madam Chair. Representative. Well, I'm, essentially that was the meat of this, the, this bill, was to find out whether or not the electronic rosters was indeed uh, the panacea that we all hope that it will be. Now we're gonna, have, we're gonna be left with a report that you're gonna do for free uh, essentially, and, uh, and and hope that you know that will gather or uh, give us or inform us enough so that we can make a decision. So essentially, what you're left with is just the state's permission for um, the folks that are listed to participate in uh, exploring using electronic rosters, and that's about it. Is that correct? 
The other part is that it actually You're opens up. Lane. Thank you. It, it opens up for any municipality to use electronic rosters. The the ones listed were part of the study. M Madam Chair and Ms. Fraser. Representative Benson, we did prepare two reports this past year. One was on the pilot project that was conducted. I don't know if you've if you've read the report, but the municipalities that participated had a variety of experiences, used a variety of different vendors technology, and found that there were cases where the technology was helpful and sped up the process. There were cases where the technology was not helpful and actually created lines in an off-year election, which is a challenge, but they succeeded at doing that. And so I think that what we are looking to do and what the task force recommended that both Representative O'Driscoll and Representative Lane served on, as well as members of local jurisdictions and um, senators, is to do another study to look at this in a high volume election, to continue working with the vendors to refine the technology so that it fully, so it has all the functionality that's needed, allow the local jurisdictions to use the technology that they think makes the most sense. This eliminates the need for doing um, double processing, which was required in the last pilot project. It required <coughs> voters that came in to both use the electronic rosters and fill out the paperwork associated with them, as well as fill out all of the paperwork that they would normally fill out. And so voters were confused about why this was so much more complicated. It streamlines the process, but still requires a paper backup. Um, and we think that this doing this in a higher volume election will give local units of government the information they need to decide whether this is a good investment of tax dollars. So even though it was used in an off-year election, if there were only, for example, six same-day registrations in the polling place, it doesn't give the local election judges, the city officials, or the county officials who process the data after the fact a lot of information about how much time might be saved since they're only processing six records. Whereas if this were in a regular statewide election where there are hundreds of thousands of same-day registrants, they would actually get much more information that would be helpful. Madam Chair. Representative Benson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I like the idea of, and the ability for the local mis municipalities to be able to um, uh, experiment, if you will. I'm hoping that at some point that we, we, we do focus on a little bit of standardization for equipment. Um, and my assumption is that it would have to meet some criteria of the S Secretary of State's office in terms of data transfer, data privacy, and, and things of that nature. But I think, in fact, members, we are probably gutting out the piece that really makes the most sense, and that is to hire somebody who really can analyze the data using data analytics to explore whether or not this is a process to go forward uh, and, and uh, you know, inculcate this into our election process. I, you know, my, my worry is, I, I remember uh, a couple years ago that we got, uh, you know, fiscal notes that said this was going to be a 20-some million dollar uh, expenditure when we were talking about poll books. And uh, we're, of course, now, uh, you know, different administration. It's not so expensive. But, but nevertheless, there will be a, an expense uh, incurred uh, by both local or state governments. My assumption that it, it won't be an unfunded liability on our local governments. But I, I'm not sure that we're getting the best for our dollar by not having somebody that can come in and really provide that. If it's, I, I mean, you know, all, all deference to the Secretary of State's office, a free report, uh, assuming you know that all you're doing is collecting and uh, you know uh, and collecting data and, and put it in a, in a, in a form that uh, summarizes, I guess, uh, what the various experiences are from municipalities that use the system. And Madam Chair, a question on process. Representative Preshaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just wondering, have we moved the bill yet? I we seem to be in the meat of this, and I I'm I'm wondering if we're ahead of ourselves. Oh, we have moved the bill. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, but we haven't moved the final. That's right. Okay. Representative Lane. 
I just want to say that one of the things that the pilot study did not do is have software that could download directly from the Secretary of State into your local electronic poll book and then upload after the election back up to the Secretary of State office. That upload after the election is a very costly, time-consuming process. That's where we'll save the most time and the most cost at the local level. So we wanted to evidence that and prove that, but now we'll have to report on that. <laughs> But the point is that the, private, the pilot study did not have that access, access to that software. That software is now there, and it's written into the rest of this bill that tells a local jurisdiction if they want to use electronic rosters, here's the rules, here's what you have to do to do it. Um, so there will be savings at the local level. Madam Chair. Nelson. I'll move that House File 2166 be laid over till our Wednesday meeting to give uh, <laughs> opportunity to get the amendments. This, this, this last amendment drafted so it's an under, we can understand what we're looking at. Thank you. And then during that time, we will have an up and down vote. If there's any further questions that you have, 2166 about the roster and about the policy that's left, try to speak to Representative Lane or Ms. Fraser before for Wednesday and get those questions answered. We've had more than enough time. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Represent Dorfle. <laughs> Madam Chair, I would like to move uh, House File 2785. For consideration. For consideration. Representative Dorho, welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for, for hearing us today. Uh, before you have House File 2785, um, as a certified rehabilitation counselor, I do find this kind of near and dear to um, what I do professionally, uh, as well as um, just the staggering statistic of what you see in front of you if you have a handout. In 1999, a little over 10 percent of state workers uh, had disability. 2013 is 3.2 percent, and we believe that we need to get to the bottom of, of why this is. So to explain a little bit about this bill, I do have uh, Jessalyn Ackman Frank here to uh, share with you a little bit about uh, what, we're, what we're aiming for here. All right. Ms. Ackerman Frank. Thank you. My name is Jessalyn Ackerman Frank, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing us to testify today for House File 2785. As said, my name is Jessalyn Ackerman Frank. I'm the Public Policy Director for the Commission serving deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing. We are a small state agency that advocates for equal opportunity in employment, education, health care, and technology. I want to thank Representative Dorholt for sponsoring this important bill. You will see on the chart before you the stark numbers. We have gone from a 10.1% state workers having a disability in 1999 to only 3.2% in 2013. Only 1.9% of new hires last year had a disability. The state isn't hiring many people with disabilities and we want that to change. House File 2785 would provide for a study for a centralized accommodations fund. A centralized fund is currently used by the federal government. They attribute it as, a pivot, as pivotal to their success in hiring more people with disabilities. Last year it was close to 15 percent. They budget and plan for accommodations and state agencies can tap into the fund. 
Four other states have adopted this practice. We would like to work with Minnesota uh, Management and Budget to study if this practice could help us get the state back on track and eliminate unintentional or intentional discrimination based on a hiring manager's ability to pay for accommodations. The Commission has budgeted for meetings to address barriers to employment. Convening this group to collaborate with MMB would be considered part of the Commission's work plan and could be done without extra funds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ackerman Frank. <coughs> Representative Dorholt? I guess we'll have any questions. Is there another person? Um, uh, no, he's Alan not with us. He's not with us. Today, okay. So. Is there someone from MMB here? Mr. Pollard. <laughs> Manager. Mr. Pollard, were you here when I gave the statement that the general fund target for state government finance is zero? Yes, Madam Chair. So does MMB have money for this study and for this bill? Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Pollard, Minnesota Management and Budget Communications and Legislative Director. Madam Chair, I am not sure if a fiscal note has been requested yet on this bill. I have not seen one, um, and so it's probably premature to comment on that. Uh, we would probably have to talk to the budget officers to see if there would be a cost or not. Okay. Perhaps, Mr. Pollard, a fiscal note has been requested, and I think it was a rush was placed on it, but we have not received it. I will be sure to follow up with you, Madam Chair, and the members of the committee to get you an answer as soon as we can. All right. Thank you very much. Madam Chair. Mr. Do Represent Benson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Pollard, if, if you could come back um, to the stand. These are stark um, no numbers. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not you could comment at all, uh, you know, regarding uh, a, such a significant drop-off and has, uh, has your department looked into this at all? You know, I, I know this covers... Uh, you know all agencies, but um, I was just wondering if you had any comments in terms of such a precipitous drop from 10% in 1999 to uh, the low of just over 2%. Madam Chair, Representative Mr. Benson, um, I am certainly not an HR expert that could comment on this. You make an excellent point right off the bat that it is all state agencies being looked at here, and so I would have to find you somebody. Uh, MMB and the HR department that could take a look at these numbers. Um, the Disability Council actually might have more insight than I do at this point. Um, we could certainly follow up with you and let you know if we think that there is a reason or many reasons why. I'm really not able to comment or even qualify. Madam Chair, but you do assume that these are accurate numbers? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Benson, I have no judgment either way. I wouldn't know. Mr. Pollard, when you go back, you might also say that we have received large, an exceptionally large number of emails of people from across the state <coughs> that uh, wish to see the study take place. And I think every, everyone must have received them in the last three or four days, or five days since it's been mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Yes. Yes. M Ms. Hartnett. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Mary Hartnett, and I'm the exec executive director of the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and um, Hard of Hearing. In, in response to the question related to the accuracy of the numbers, the source is the annual Minnesota State Government Workforce Reports, which comes from MMB. So um, it is an accurate report, and we received uh, this report from the Governor's Workforce Development Council. Um, in response to why have the numbers gone down, our commission has been convening a group for over two years to look at this question. Um, part of uh, the answer lies in that we've kind of dropped the ball. Uh, up until 1999, uh, from the time the Americans with Disabilities Act and passed in 1990 to 1999, and a report was issued every three months where hiring managers received information on 
uh, the hires and the targets for uh, people that are available to participate in the workforce with people with disabilities. And when the Department of Employer Relations was closed, um, that report stopped being issued. So, um, and it was about that time that it stopped being issued. And so people aren't looking at those reports. And if you don't see um, it on a regular basis, I think it just, it's out of sight, out of mind. So our office is working with other disability advocates to work with the governor's office to try to get an executive order issued. But um, one of the things that he cannot do um, is to ask for this study or to, for a consolidated fund because that's something that only the legislature can do. So that's why we're coming before you today. Madam Chair. Representative Benson. Uh, is, this, is this bill being laid over and will be reheard again since there isn't any money? Um, I, I, my, my hope would, would be that we'd come back with a little bit more details from HR in terms of has reporting changed? Are the metrics by which we take these numbers, have they changed? Uh, you know, we're talking about 15-year period, um, how people report, whether or not they're disabled or not. If that, has that changed at all? Because that's an alarming number. Uh, you know, if, if we have 50,000 state employees and at 10 percent it was 5,000 and it's now half that amount or no, quarter of that amount, that's, that's um, a, a pretty drastic drop. So uh, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, just where we're at. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ms. Hartnett. Um, you said the re a report was discontinued. When was that discontinued? Uh, um, uh, Mr. Ms. Chair, Hartnett. Um, uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and Representative Nelson, um, the uh, the report I believe um, uh, I got, got the report. Um, I started in state government in 2001, and I received that report for about s probably six months. So around 2001, I think it stopped being issued, 2001. Just being distributed to all hiring managers. Thank you. Any other further questions? Thank you. O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarification, Representative Benson's question, we are not taking action on this until we get the, the fiscal information. Is that correct? The this is the finance committee, and uh, otherwise I'm confused why this why this bill is before us. If there's no fiscal oversight for this committee, I'm just questioning them why we had the bill in front of us. Because they were what the representative Darhill's bill was sent to this committee. Government op heard the committee, I believe, before, and it was sent to this committee because it costs money. Right. And so to the question, are we laying it over, there's no action that we're going to take, what's, what's our next course of action on, uh, on this bill? The next course of action is when, if we have a fiscal note before our final deadline, um, it could come up. And since, Madam Chair, since we don't have uh, any other uh, modified targets for our budget, MMB would have to determine whether or not they would have internal resources. Is that the course that's that we're, we're, we're charting for this? That's correct. Just want a clarification. Thank you. Yes. And that's exactly clear. the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Representative uh, Dorholt, do you have anything else? Uh, thank you for, very much. I know we're a difficult spot with that target, and I appreciate you hearing this today. Representative Wills has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Dorholt, I just had a, a question on the language that says that it's for the executive branch state employees and just wondering um, why it's exclusive to just the executive branch and why you're not also looking at the legislative and judicial branches. Representative Dorholt or Ms. Hartnett. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, we um, would be... Uh, we, we actually uh, would be happy to look at all branches of uh, state government, but w this is what we had um, assumed we would be able to address. We were limiting the scope of it, but we would be happy to expand the scope if that's a possibility. Um, and, and may I speak to just the, uh, the fiscal note? Um, if, there, if it does come back, the, that's why the commission put its name in there, not only because we can convene all of the group stakeholders and have budgeted to do that, but we also have, um, uh, in preparation for this, uh, some uh, salary savings because we were unable to hire a, uh, for a position. Somebody turned us down and then that 
um, for an extended time, we've just about to make that higher. So we do have some salary savings that we would be able to apply toward this. Thank you very much, Representative Dor Holt. I will lay this bill over. Thank you. Thank you. House file 2117, Representative Howe. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Representative Leiter. While, while we're getting ready, I, I, I also have a question along the lines of uh, what Representative O'Driscoll was talking about. So just a little clarification. You know, last year, it seems to me, in the budget, we uh, allocated uh, at least 1% additional dollars that uh, for um, for every agency, at least one percent, and uh, I'm just wondering: uh, are are agencies now coming looking for new money, like the last bill we just saw, or are they able to at least tell us what they have done with the one percent additional dollars that that were given to them last year? That were that was uh, they did not need to account for. We didn't require accounting for that. <laughs> Um, is it possible to get the agencies to at least address that? Yes. Representative Leidegger, we did that in the, <coughs> at, somewhat at the January meeting, and um, we didn't have, you know, we, we did not have total accountability, but much of the increases went for the employees' pay contracts. Represent Lily's bill that passed out of here last week. And did that cover, did that go across all agencies in, that are under our purview? Pretty much. Pretty much. And then we had, we had the reports that were given at the January meeting on what they did, what big changes they had made. But we didn't, we have not talked about the smaller expenditures and the agency isn't coming uh, with this because that's a special not a special but um, an interest and a need you, you. and I expect just as with all the bills that we all have authored, we thought maybe there might be some more money, but there isn't. And so if we get the fiscal note, we can better understand it, just like we can reconsider if we get the fiscal note or if the department, if the, if the department gets as many emails as we got <coughs> on this issue. There's still three weeks left, or two weeks left. Well, and I'll just follow up with it. It would be great if the agencies would indicate that on their fiscal notes if they're going to absorb it within their within their budget. And that's part of the fiscal note. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Representative Howe. Thank you, Chair Murphy. And we're going to hold this bill over also. All right. But I want to know more about it. Well, thank you. So, I, you Chair Murphy, given. I move House File 2117 to be considered by the committee. I would also move the uh, delete all amendment DE2. Representative Powell moves the adoption of DE2. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is adopted. 2117. Thank you. I would also like to move the amended. A3. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd also like to move the A3 amendment. Representative Powell moves the adoption of 2117A3. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is adopted. And I would also, Madam Chair, like to move the 2117A4 amendment. Okay. 
Rips and Hamu's adoption of A4. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is adopted. Now is the bill in the order that you like it? Yes, Madam Chair. It is in the form that I would prefer it to be. All right. And members, uh, thank you for hearing the bill, Madam Chair. And members, I first plan to relate to you why this bill is necessary. <clears throat> then go through the bill as to what changes it makes to the current law, and finally to hear testimony from my testifier. This bill is to address the event of a, ver a veteran that was put on notice to be terminated from employment, city employment, who then exercised his right for a veteran's hearing. The result of the veteran's hearing was the veteran was reinstated. So he got his job back. The problem was, is then the city filed a $64,000 lawsuit against the veteran for the cost of the veteran's hearing. This was unusual as in the past it was usually understood that the employer paid the cost of the hearing. But in statute, in this section of the statute and the veteran's hearing, it was silent. This bill modifies the process and identifies who pays what. Well, to the bill, and I plan to go line by line as to the changes. Lines 1.22 to 1.25 clarifies the veterans hearing process as it makes it the same for all veterans regardless of the, if the city has a civil service board or not. As it eliminates the use of the civil service board in, vet, in the veterans hearing process. The reason we did that is because the Civil Service Board is appointed by the city, has a close relationship to the city, and many veterans don't believe that they get an impartial hearing with the use of the Civil Service Board. Lines 1.26 to 2.1 retains the three-person board with the veteran and the political subdivision or the employer, each selecting a person for the board. Line 2.2 to 2.7 changes the method, the method excuse me, of selecting the third party of the board. The third party would now be selected by the parties from a list of seven arbitrators from the Bureau of Mediation Services. The reason we, did, we have it from a list of seven arbitrators instead of mediators is because arbitrators are trained to review the facts and relate it to the law and come to a decision. Mediators are trained to bring up, bring up a compromise and bring the two groups together regardless of the facts and regardless of the law. Lines 2.15 to 2.21 are deleted as it relates to the process of the selecting the third party of the board relating to a judge selecting that party if the two parties cannot agree on a third party. Lines 2.21 and 2.25 adds a 60-day time limit for the political subdivision or the employer to make their selection to the board. If they do not make that selection in the 60 days, the veteran is reinstated with no other further hearing process required. There was always a requirement for the veteran to select their person in 60 days, there was, but it was, uh, it was silent as to the city or the employer. This makes the requirement the same for both parties. Lines 2.26 to 2.30 retains the right of either the veteran or the political subdivision to appeal the decision of the board to the district court. Lines 3.1 and with the new amendment identifies that the political subdivision will pay the cost of the hearing and each party will pay their own attorney fees. Lines 3.6 to 3.8 establishes a six month timeline for a resolution of the hearing process except that that may be with 
with the uh, amendment A4 now allows it to be waived by the veteran. And the veteran continues to receive all pay and benefits during the hearing process. And that's currently how it's being practiced today. But this puts it in the in this statute. Lines 3.9 to 3.14 requires that the board must determine if the political subdivision or an employer acted with intentional disregard for the protections of this law. If so, the veteran is to receive triple damages. Lines 3.15 to 3.16 states the effective date of the final enactment. Now, if you'd like, Madam Chair, I'd like to go to the testifier. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Joseph Kelly. Uh, I am a, an attorney uh, who practices primarily in uh, labor and employment law. And one of the areas where uh, I practice significantly in is uh, veterans preference, both on uh, the veteran side and then my firm represents a number of uh, public employers uh, and public employee unions. So we deal with both sides of this. and. Uh, what we've noticed in, in my research and my experience is uh, uh, about every year this issue seems to come up where whether the employer is responsible for the cost of the hearing. A review of the Office of Minister of Hearing shows in 2012 this case came up, uh, although it came up before the hearing itself. Uh, in 2013, the case that I had, it was an 11-day hearing, eight of which were spent by the employer presenting their case on why the veteran should have been terminated. The panel ultimately determined that uh, termination was inappropriate and returned the uh, veteran to his job. Two weeks after the decision being rendered, he was served with a lawsuit for the costs associated with the hearings. Although it's common practice, uh, Office of Ministry of Hearings, League of Minnesota Cities, Department of Veterans Affairs, and some district court cases have all found the employer is responsible for the cost of the hearing uh, because it is considered a property right to continued employment, uh, continued public employment because of the Veterans Preference Act being passed and under the 14th Amendment and Article 1, Section 7 of the Minnesota Constitution uh, that cannot be deprived without due process of the law. Uh, therefore, you cannot have a, an individual having to make a financial determination prior to making their decision on whether to exercise a constitutionally protected due process right. And the reason why this is so important is, although it's generally understood uh, in the legal community that this is how it works, it's to protect the outliers. It's to protect the cases where uh, a veteran such as my client su succeeds at his case, uh, requested his hearing, uh, was given his hearing, and then turns around and is faced with having to defend uh, a meritless lawsuit. Um, further, to pro it would provide further protection because uh, a review of the uh, Bureau of Mediation Services website, which uh, publishes a number of veterans' preference cases, shows that oftentimes veterans will be unrepresented at the hearing. They'll represent themselves, and the panel members will be chosen, as, as supposed to be chosen by the three parties, but oftentimes it's a panel of three BMS arbitrators, um, and I know in some cases when dealing with veterans individually, the employer has uh, required that the veteran pay certain costs associated with the hearing. And by putting it into statute, uh, it would clarify something that is already would be mandated by, by the Constitution and uh, the courts across the country have all uh, roundly held that to require an individual to make a financial determination when uh, before exercising a constitutionally protected due process right to continued employment would have such a chilling effect that it would, uh, it would possibly require the veteran to not pursue their constitutional rights. Um, and as to the ar why an arbitrator, normally that's who the third, new the third panel member is uh, because the Minnesota Supreme Court has deemed uh, the as it is in 197.46, I should clarify, it says the only reason you can be removed is for misconduct or incompetence. And the Minnesota Supreme Court has interpreted that law uh, correctly, in my opinion, to say that that is equivalent to just cause. Uh, and the BMS arbitrators 
all are required to make decisions on uh, termination and discipline for just cause. So they have the experience uh, necessary to make those determinations, which is why they generally are normally the third neutral chosen for the panel members. Or Mr. Kelly, what about this new three-member board, three-person board? Are, are you substituting that for the current civil service board? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just for clarification, uh, there are a number of cities that have civil service commissions right. and, and, and counties that have uh, personal boards of appeal that may or may not actually qualify as a civil service commission. Uh, the issue that, that we've noticed in representing uh, veterans specifically in front of those commissions is the panel members, the commission members, may not have the experience necessary to make the appropriate determinations, number one. Number two, they are all appointed by the employer, as opposed to the three panel member uh, where you have one member appointed by each and a neutral as a third uh, me uh, panel member. As opposed to a civil service commission or merit systems authority, the entire panel is appointed by the employer, the city, or the political subdivision. Madam Chair, if I may, the, the three-member the three panel always existed as an option if they didn't have a civil service board. The only thing we changed was the selection of the third party. Okay. And, and the civil, if they have a civil service board, the civil service board would make the decision. Not any longer. Not if this not bill is longer. passed. So uh, this, this then this is huge this changes all of the civil not all of the civil all service the preference uh, veterans preference stuff it madam chair it it just changes the veterans hearing when it relates to discharge what it does is i think it gives you a very impartial panel as opposed to a panel that was selected by the employer. Okay. Mr. Kelly, um, who made the decision for your client? As, Madam Chair, as far as the ultimate decision of the panel or the decision of the intent to terminate? The yeah. ultimate decision. The ultimate decision uh, uh, where he was reinstated to work, uh, Madam Chair, was it was a unanimous decision by all three panel members. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, some of the stuff I recognize from my previous employment and as a labor representative, the Bureau of Mediation Services, picking both sides, picking from a list and going down that. So some of this is, I, I understand where you're going with this, but Normally when we've had uh, in the past where, where a labor or union wants to contest a firing and you go to the Bureau of Mediation Services, at the end of the day, each side pays half the cost. And you pay for yours and they pay for theirs. Um, that's the only difference I really see here. And uh, But the rest of this looks like you're just deciding you want to have it go there instead of have it done by the Civil Service Board. I guess the question I really have here, would, and it kind of pegs on what Representative Murphy asked was, Chair Murphy asked was, the issue, the, the, the individual you got rid of, or you, you, you representative and got his job back, did that municipality subdivision have a Civil Service Board, or did they go through this process except that they, did, they, they had all three picked by the man, management? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, Kelly. Representative Nelson, um, as far as the, uh, I'll take your points in order. Uh, first, where uh, a labor organization and a public employer, or actually private employer also, but that would be the FMCS, not the BMS that does the private employers. But for the Bureau of Mediation Services, when the labor organization and a public employer have uh, an arbitration uh, to, uh, when there's a challenge for termination, uh, f first, uh, it the challenge is not based upon a statute, it's based upon the contract. Uh, so therefore it's not actually a constitutionally protected property interest uh, or a due process right at that point. 
the due process required in public employment is merely a louder mill hearing, having the hearing where you sit down with whoever has the ultimate authority and they tell you why you're going to be fired. You can say, I disagree with it. And they say, well, here's your letter of termination. The grievance process is contract related, not statutorily created. Um, as far as, uh, and that's why the costs associated uh, are generally in the contract, the collective bargaining agreement will say that uh, normally the contract has some sort of provision that says the cost will be borne equally by the parties. Um, and I can tell you that the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals and uh, the California Supreme Court have both found in specifically teachers termination cases where there were statutes on the books that stated in, in Oklahoma the 10th Circuit said that the cost shall be borne equally by the teacher and the independent school district, the employer. That went all the way to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals which found because it's a constitutionally protected property right that you cannot deprive them without due process of the law, the statute was unconstitutional on its face because of the possible chilling effect that it would have on the, the employee. And that's, in that case, that statute limited the costs at $250 per person per day. In, in this case, in, in veterans preference cases, there's no caps or anything like that. Uh, and the nice thing about with BMS arbitrators is every single arbitrator has their costs, their daily fees posted on the Bureau of Mediation Services website. So there's, there can be an expectation of costs, whereas, for instance, in my case, uh, I can tell you normally the, I think the longest previous termination in uh, both the Arbitration and uh, Veterans Preference Act cases that I've had has been entered between two and three days. And this was an 11-day hearing that took eight, the first eight days were the city attempting to terminate this veteran unsuccessfully at the end of the day and unanimously. And to your point as to what, what type of uh, panel they had, it was the three-member panel, uh, not a civil service commission, board, or merit systems authority. Under statute right now, a civil service commission cannot, does not have any per diem or any costs. So the city is responsible for the costs of a civil service commission, but they're not allowed to be paid for their service. Madam Chair. Did, San Nelson. So the municipality that this went through did not have a civil service commission. They used the three person, the current three person. I see you're shaking yes. your head. Representative Nelson, yes, that's correct. In 2001, this city had eliminated its civil service commission, as a, a large number of cities have, because uh, under statute, they have to be involved in the hiring process. And that's ultimately been the reason why a lot of cities have eliminated their civil service commissions or uh, boards because of. It, it makes it a little more difficult to hire somebody. Department of Veterans Affairs. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Mike McKellen from the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, in short, MDVA does not support this bill. Uh, to use a simple analogy, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, we just heard Mr. Kelly talk about how the process worked. And although, as, as we look at this, it's, it's one veteran, uh, and veterans, of course, come from military, so we, we recognize that we leave no one behind. And so when we look at this, this issue and this, this bill that has come forward, uh, we think about how we typically do business. And, and when we look at things, and, and, and before we come over here to these committees and come to the legislature, we often take a look at how many people does it affect, how many people will it affect. And we try to get the most bang for our buck, hundreds, thousands, or ten thousands, as, as we heard this morning in the rotunda. There's 300 and nearly 78,000 veterans in this state, and we're talking about uh, one veteran and one case in particular, which is why we're here uh, with you today. Um, but again, we, we have worked with uh, Mr. Kelly and, and Representative Howe for about the last month on this bill, and it's ebbed and flowed and changed and come back to us. And at the end of the day, we just don't support the, 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 the way the bill sits at this point in time. And we, we've, there's a lot of unanswered questions. I, there was a physical note attached to this bill. Um, it, was, uh, it was due at one point, and the date had changed on the physical note. There's a lot of information that we don't understand at this point in time as far as costs, uh, potential costs for these changes, 
Uh, and so we would just ask Madam Chair and Representative Howe to continue to work on this bill to get it in the form that it needs to be. But uh, what it needs to be in, uh, uh, from our standpoint at this point in time is the same as it always has been. It's worked fine, and we don't believe that it needs to be changed. Mr. Booker. Madam Chair, Clint Buecher, Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Yes, ma'am. Did you have anything to add? Well, yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair, I and members of the uh, your committee. Your position with the Department of v Veterans Affairs, will you state what your position is there? The Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs supports uh, Minnesota Statute 197.46 in its current form without the proposed changes in this bill, 2117. Thank you. Uh, Representative Flesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McKinley, what, what municipality was this that we're talking about that caused the, uh, the soldier, in, in this case, problems, if you're aware of it? Madam Chair and Representative Flesh, I would defer to uh, Mr. Buecher, who can explain the, the finite details. It's my understanding, uh, Madam Chair, um, Representative, uh, it's my understanding that this uh, was in the city of Hopkins, and Mr. Kelly, who uh, was involved representing the case, could be more specific on that. Um, does, does, does that answer your question? Well, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, Mr. Buecher, it does answer my question, at least in the instant case. And I'm kind of wondering, <laughs> um, because when I heard Mr. Kelly speak, I mean, that chagrined me a bit uh, that if, if I was in a situation where all of a sudden I get sued for 60000 or 80000 or however much that was, and I'm wondering, uh, have has has the department had any conversations with municipalities or political subdivisions um, explaining to them how to operate under the law if that's the understanding and I'm wondering um, if it did go wrong in this instance um, ended up costing the taxpayers money that the municipality did that in the first place is the department working with municipalities so that they don't stick their foot in it again Mr. Booker. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, uh, Representatives, uh, basically the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs in the Veterans Preference Office does provide information upon request uh, to the municipalities, the political subdivisions, uh, regarding any questions they have about uh, the general notion of veterans preference, but we do not have the authority or expertise to provide legal advice. Uh, but we take, we feel questions uh, uh, if on a weekly basis, at least on a biweekly basis, whereby uh, if they want to know, for example, how to set up the point system, if they want us to review the uh, their employment application process, we would provide re review in common with the understanding that they still have to take it back to their attorney. So we do provide that information, but primarily, it's, uh, as we say, available all, all, on request because we cannot basically be sticking our nose in their business and tell them how to run that. Uh, but we do certainly want to work with them when they have questions to provide the overview of the Veterans Preference Act. Well, Madam Chair, so when I'm, when I'm, what I heard Mr. Mc, uh, McElhinney say when he came and testified first was if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We just heard uh, Mr. Kelly and Representative Howe testify about a situation where, at least from my understanding, it was broke. I mean, there, there was definitely a problem there. Um, so is the characterization that uh, we're trying to to kill a fly with a baseball bat, or there's just too small of a problem, and this would be too big of a club, uh, because in your opinion it works just fine for 99 percent, or are there other cases out there you think that we could come across if folks like Mr. Kelly or Representative Howe brought them forward? Madam Mr. Chair, and, and Representative Lesh, it, it, it's hard to tell at this point. We're, we're trying not to use the the hammer solution. Uh, but we do want to understand a little bit more of the data, how many cases are actually out there, what are the actual costs to all the cases, and we don't collect that data, and, and that might be something that we would wisely do in the future. Uh, and uh, again, one, one person, that, that's a huge bill for any, any person, let alone any veteran, to have to deal with. Uh, but. You know, at the end of the day, we have not heard a, a ton of feedback that we must make these changes. We, we've heard from a couple of people. Um, LMC has not come to us. 
on this. AMC has not come to us on this. We understand that there's been some work collectively with those different organizations, but no one has come to MDVA besides the point of a bill being introduced to work diligently on fixing a solution or to identify if there is, in fact, a solution or if it's just this one bad issue that we can resolve another way. Madam Chair. We still have one more bill up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to drill down a little bit on who exactly ended up paying the $64,000 and then this individual was sued. Was it the department that initially had to pay this, or was that a local municipality that paid this? Mr. Buecher. No, another question. Madam Chair, Representatives, in this example, it was the political subdivision that was required to pay it. It was the city of Hopkins. It was the city. Thank you, Madam Chair. The city of Hopkins paid it, and that's what I thought. So there were no dollars paid for by the department in this case, in my understanding. And I just heard Representative Howe go through this bill line item by line item, and I want to say that at the end of it, when he did, when he went through it, it seemed very fair. He seemed to go through this with great strides in making sure that it was very clear which party had to pay what portion of the cost of when you have to take something like this to the Veterans Board. And, I mean, really painstakingly separating out who's responsible for what. And here you have a case that has brought this to us whereby a veteran gets dismissed, he brings it before the board, he ends up winning the job back and then gets saddled with this by a local municipality. And here's a bill that comes to us that seems to make it a much fairer process, and the department was not hurt on this at all, and yet the department is kind of ambivalent, and to me it's like, you know, we're throwing this one veteran to the wolves. I mean, it just feels that way, and this is what I'm hearing. And I think that's what Representative Lesh was kind of driving towards as well. I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but this kind of, this looks like it's something that should be supported. Madam Chair and Representative, there are a lot of areas in the bill that we agree with that bring clarity where there is none, where there's an ambiguous provision perhaps. But as Mr. Buecher just pointed out, the political subdivision paid, and that's the way the system, the way the veterans' preference laws are supposed to work. So certainly a veteran was countersued for the cost, and it was a scary situation. No one would want to be in that situation. But at the end of the day, the way the bill, the way the statute is supposed to work, worked, and that's having the political subdivision pay for those costs. Just one last comment. I'm sure there's others that will talk about it. The guy got saddled with, he got sued for $64,000. To me, that's not taking care of our guys. I'll just pass it to someone else. Madam Chair. Mr. Buecher. Madam Chair, Representative, I would like to reiterate that when the dust settled, the veteran prevailed, and the employer was responsible to pay for all of it. So the veteran was not responsible to pay for the court costs when the dust settled. It was reaffirmed, in fact, that the city must pay, which is simply what's implied in the law now, and that's been the standard cases, the standard examples. So I don't want to sound flip, and I don't want to imply that the law is perfect now, 
but the position of it, it speaks to the fact that the employee, this political subdivision must pay for the court cost. Mm -hmm. and, and we support, as an agency, we support that concept. So I, 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 hope, you, I hope you don't feel we're turning our backs on veterans, sir. Rep. Ha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the fact of the case is, is the city has not paid. Uh, no one's paid the $64,000 bill. It still hangs out there. It has not been resolved. Uh, and, and Mr. Kelly could, could attest to that, but I, I, and the, to say that the veteran wasn't harmed, I'm sure he had to pay Mr. Kelly's law firm for his piece of this deal, and it would remain the same going forward. Thank you, Representative Howe. Um, Ma Madam Chair, if I may. Pass, way past the time, and Representative Detmer has guests here too, um, so I want to give him at least five minutes. Um, Representative Howe, is there a Senate companion? Yes, there is, Madam Chair. It, it, uh, we wanted to make the, the bill in the form it needed to be in, so the, the Senator Fishbach held on to the bill until today it has been dropped in the hopper and is moving forward. Okay, and we need a, we need a fiscal note, and we also need... Uh, does, have you discussed this with the Bureau of Mediation Services yet, Representative Howe? Pardon, Madam Chair? Have you discussed this with the Bureau of Mediation Services? I have not, Madam Chair, but I, I have talked to the League of Minnesota Cities. They've been involved from step one, so we, we'll continue to work. And if I need to go to Bureau of Mediation Service, what question do you want me to ask them? Well, they're, since they're mentioned, do you want to make sure that they know about it and to Absolutely. see what they think about the whole deal? Um, because, Representative Howe, we don't have the Bureau of Mediation, Mediation Services as one of our agencies, and so it will also have to have another stop if it did get out of here. If it does get out of here, it, it has a road to go. It doesn't go from here. It, GovOps hasn't heard it either yet, so it has to go there, and I'm, whoever has mediation services will have to hear it, I'm sure. Well, I'm pretty sure. I thought they were going to kill it. So we've heard it. We have the information. What? Um, oh. We will um, lay this bill over. Thank you. Representative Detmer. Yes. You have an opportunity to speak or not? Well, you can take your pick on this bill or the Detmer bill. On this bill, Mr. Kaiser. I'm sorry, you were, I didn't have you down. Well, I thought you would call for us, ma'am, and that's okay. Okay. Uh, Representative, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, I'm Jerry Kaiser. I'm the uh, Vice Chairman of the United Veterans Legislative Council. We represent 34 of the uh, veterans organizations in the state of Minnesota, the 377,000 of them, and uh, we are not in favor of this bill. Uh, more work needs to be done, I'm sure. And uh, a couple of things in there, uh, he was going through uh, part 2.1 to 2.5. As far as I know, the number of people that uh, all these different uh, veterans uh, programs they've had, there's not been a problem for the veteran to get the two people involved with it and they have a, a, a third one. They've not had a problem to do that and, and it's... Uh, it's detrimental to change everything right away. I'm sure it needs to be uh, adjudicated to the point. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have the ability to go through this. But another part of it, at the bottom, it says here, uh, if the person is uh, determined to be in, intentionally disregarded for his protection, the veteran is entitled to three times the actual damages. <clears throat> the state of Minnesota is the largest employer of all veterans. And, and, and anything and anything uh, of employers in the state of Minnesota, it throws a cold water on the into, uh, entity that's going to be hiring veterans. That if something goes wrong, you're going to get three times the benefits. We're in the process of trying to make Minnesota more veteran friendly, to hire more veterans. We just saw that only two percent of veterans are, are two percent of the disabled people are hired in the state of Minnesota, and it's for us. It needs to be more. 
more work needs to be done with the Department of Veteran Affairs and others to make it work right. And uh, that's all I have to say about it, ma'am. I, 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 uh, I agree that it needs to be worked on, but the answer is uh, the veteran community is not happy with this. It needs to be more work. Thank, Thank you very much. Sir, as long as we're here. <laughs> Madam Chair, members. I am actually a veteran that... You have to okay, identify sorry. yourself. Alan Bradford. Mr. Bradford. I am a veteran that went through this with Anoka County. I was terminated. I rec uh, according to the rules and regulations of Anoka County, I had a choice between Veterans Preference and the Personal Board of Appeal. I chose the Veterans Preference and gave them my person who I wanted on the board. They, in turn, set up a personal board of appeals because they said they are a merit system, so therefore they get to choose. They chose a ex-city uh, council member. A city council member, or a person who was running for city council member, who was also on a billboard for the uh, Noka County Commissioner, and a third person who during the hearing made jokes about a uh, ex Noka County personnel. Then he admitted that he was a f uh, friend, him and the assistant attorney were friends. Now, nobody on that board was looking out after my interests. No one cared about what happened. Uh, my lawyer, uh, when we went to the board, he said he had three days. I had 45 minutes. He said that the chairperson said each person has 45 minutes to present their case. Where in the court of law is there where it states that Okay, I'm going to allocate this much time to you or this much time to another person. This bill gets rid of the county's influence on the, on the hearing. Let the people, let, you know, the veteran pick his person, let the county pick theirs, and let the third person be a medium, a medium person. Do not let the cities basically ruined other people's lives. It cost me over $21,000 just for my hearings because I had to pay my own uh, lawyer costs. And my lawyer was lousy to say the least, but do not allow other lawyers into the hearing. Keep it the way it is as far as uh, one veteran picked one, the government agency picks one, and then they picked a third. This is the best, fairest way that we can do it. Thank you. The present, you're, you're, you're advocating the present system. The present system as set as for by the veterans' preference, not by the, uh, allowing the cities or counties to use their personal board of appeal, merit system, because those are set up just for helping the individual cities, not looking after veterans' rights. Thank you, Mr. One more thing. When I went to my appeal, the assistant county attorneys uh, stated that uh, veterans do not have special rights. He gave up part of his life, and he doesn't have special rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradford, for that testimony. And so your costs were $21,000? Yes. And you lost? Yes. Okay. For attorney fees. $21,000 for attorney fees. And Represent how the sixty-four thousand dollars 
that you're the person that brought the uh, uh, the issue to your attention that still has not been paid even though it's been told they've been told to pay this the city of Hopkins has not paid any bills yet city of Hopkins have insurance uh, that it can come out of under you'd have to ask yes, I, we'll I have I, to ask that that's a continuing uh, quest for getting these these problems worked out all right thank you the bill was laid over Representative Detmer has and it's after the hour Mr. Bradford was talking about when do we put time limits on things well I had 15 minutes extra that I was going to hear from some stories but um, we don't have that and we don't have time for your bill represent Detmer but I want to hear from the Department of Administration the uh, Department of Administration yeah. have money to cover 2011 Madam Chair, members of the committee, the, Kurt Yoakum with the Minnesota Department of Administration. Uh, there's a fiscal okay. note uh, that has been requested that the uh, department has turned in. Uh, I think the overall amount is uh, 277,000. 10,000 of that is the uh, for a rule, which uh, we're absorbing. The other, the bulk of the rest of the money is for two personnel, and that we cannot absorb. Is uh, we cannot absorb hiring two additional people to do that. And the uh, fiscal note gives a pretty good breakdown as to where those costs are. It'd be two FTEs uh, for the initial um, year of certifications, and then one year subsequently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Represent Detmer. Madam Chair, uh, do we have time? Can we move the bill to uh, House File 2011? And I do have an amendment. I'd like to uh, get it in the, in the right form. Oh, yes, we, we do have that <laughs> amendment. <laughs> A1, Represent Detmer. Yes, Madam Chair. The A1 amendment just sets some uh, subcontracting goals for prime uh, contractors and also for uh, county boards, cities, and local governments. And uh, so I move uh, the A1 amendment. Okay. <laughs> Representative Detmer moves adoption of the A1 amendment. And Madam Chair, also on, I have an oral amendment. I just found out today on page three of the bill, uh, line 319, after the word businesses just uh, put the two words up to then it's a a six percent uh, preference okay. so on line 3.19 after the word businesses up to a six percent preference um represent detmer can you can that be incorporated into the a1 amendment the up to uh, no. Mr. Biggerstaff, if you can take care of that. Madam Chair, yes, the <clears throat> proper amendment, I believe, would be an amendment to the A1 amendment, um, identifying that on page 3, line 19, after businesses, insert up to. Okay. Um, all in favor of the up to amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Representative Detmer. Madam Chair, moved and A1 amendment and as Madam, amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the A1 amendment. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. And Madam Chair, uh, the bill basically what it does, it creates a new method for certifying our veterans owned small businesses um, as it relates to uh, contract bid preferences. Now, currently, we only have one method to get a a veterans owned small business uh, certified and that is through the federal VA and what this bill proposes is that we do our certification right here in Minnesota uh, right through the Department of Administration and uh, that's the key point of the bill also we set some uh, goals some uh, goals for uh, uh, cities county boards and local governments and prime contractors when uh, doing uh, subcontracting 
And uh, we we feel that uh, many of our veterans that are coming coming home that might be starting want to start businesses. We feel that this is a good good way to encourage uh, um, get their foot in the door and get them certified and get them ready to uh, you know apply and do the bids, whether it's city, county, municipalities. Now we already do this now with uh, MnDOT. We passed some legislations a few years ago where uh, uh, veterans-owned small businesses do get preferences up to 6% with uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. So we like to extend this to uh, other areas like the cities, counties. Well, any questions? And Madam Chair, and as you can see, there is a fiscal note. Uh, I, I can't see. Okay. Have you seen this fiscal note, no. Madam Chair? No. Oh. The fiscal note should have been uh, dis yeah. distributed. Because I, I, received, I received a copy of it. You're the author. We, did. we didn't get one. Not anybody's package. Okay, well, let me go. Uh, department... Department is here, and uh, we're looking at two uh, FTEs the first uh, the first year, and then uh, reduced down to one FTE the second uh, two years of 16 and 17. So you're looking at uh, there's 267 thousand uh, dollars, 300 the first year, and then 111 thousand, uh, 650. The um, the second two years for the FTEs. Now I do have a question for the department here, um, Madam Chair. The uh, the Small Business Administration had about in 2007 had uh, 43,000 veteran-owned small businesses in Minnesota, uh, and estimated approximately 600 veterans-owned small businesses would be eligible to apply for this types of uh, certification. Uh, that's almost 600 out of 43,000. Now, I've never seen the uh, 43,000 number. I know I currently I think we have about 150, 160 uh, veterans owned small businesses in Minnesota. So I don't know where these numbers came from. Mr. Yoakum? Use Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Mr. Yoakum. Uh, again, as the uh, fiscal note says, uh, we did pull those. Uh, I think the first this bill had come up uh, several years ago, and we had pulled those directly from the Small Business Administration, and that was where we got the data from. In 2000, yeah. Madam Chair, in 2007, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, from the information that I have, and uh, I think. Uh, Mr. Kaiser might want to speak to this too. Is that uh, you know we only have about 160 veterans-owned small businesses currently in Minnesota, so uh, um, I don't think we're looking at uh, um, the amount of work that would have to be done by the administration uh, to to make this work for our veterans' businesses. Thank you very much. This bill is held over. Okay. Minutes. Madam Chair, I move the minutes as printed from the March 12, 2014 meeting. Be approved. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ma Motion is adopted. Madam, Madam Chair, have we, Detmer. Have we moved uh, House Vault 2011? Laid over. Yes, you had okay. moved as amend, as amend, as amend, as amend. and I laid it over. As amended. As amended. Okay. Yes, thank you. This meeting is adjourned.